December 26, 1996. A brisk, clear morning in Boulder, Colorado. John Ramsey was up before dawn. Well, I was shaving, I guess, in the bathroom. And we have a back staircase from the bedroom areas. And I always come down that staircase. And I'm usually the first one down. And the note was lying across the run of one of the stair treads. And it was kind of dimly lit because it was very early in the morning. And I started to read it, and it was addressed to John. A terrifying message scrawled across three pages. It said, we have your daughter. I just heard Patsy scream. I could tell by her scream that something horrible was going on, I didn't know what. ran back upstairs and pushed open her door and she was not in her bed. John Benet Ramsey was found dead, strangled in the basement of that home. He wasn't kidnapped. Um, this case still never solved. No one's been held responsible. Uh, since 1996, but some huge developments tonight we want to talk about. Let's bring in our special guest joining us in New York, senior reporter for the U.S. Sun, Luke Kenton is with us. Um, Luke, great to see you. Thanks so much. Uh, read your article. Wow. Uh, let's talk about this development. It's a man named Gary Oliva. Gary Oliva. Tell us uh, what you found out about him, what his link is to John Benet Ramsey. Uh, yeah, so Gary Lever, um, first and foremost, is not a good guy. Um, the story involving Gary kind of begins on the 27th of uh, December 1996 um, when he was reported to Boulder Police um, because basically the night before he'd called an old high school friend uh, back in California who um, he, he said through tears and it could barely catch his breath, I've just hurt a little girl. So this was on the night that John Bonet's body was, uh, sorry, a few hours after uh, John Bonet's body was found on December 26th. He was crying that he'd hurt a little girl in Boulder and he hung up the phone. Uh, now his friend that was on the other end of the phone uh, wasn't, didn't know really what to make of that call, was obviously concerned, but couldn't get any information out of him. It wasn't until the next day that uh, he went on the front porch, picked up the newspaper, and saw the news that a, a six-year-old girl had been killed in, in Boulder, Colorado. He immediately calls the Boulder Police Department, uh, reports the call from the day before, um, and then three months pass, he doesn't hear anything, uh, and he calls the tip line again, reports it to Boulder Police, doesn't hear anything again. Fast forward 19 years later, um, Gary Olive is in prison uh, for child uh, pornography offences and confesses in a series of letters to the same person that he called that night, uh, claiming to have killed John Bonet by accident. This is unbelievable. I mean, it, it, this is. Um, did he? Did police ever talk to this man in California? I mean, he is claiming to have gotten a call before this story is even in the news uh, uh, from this guy. Yeah. So hours hours before it, you know, made headlines across. The country, um, he said, I've hurt a little girl, and he's in Boulder. And, and bearing in mind at the time, this guy was living, uh, or sorry, was associated with a property about 14, sorry, 13 houses away. He was, he was getting his mail from a church, 13 houses away from the, from the Ramsey family. Um, and the tip, like I said, wasn't followed up upon immediately by Boulder police at the time. They were zeroing on either Patsy or John Ramsey being uh, responsible for John Bonet's death. It wasn't actually until four years later when he was arrested on the campus of um, the University of Colorado in Boulder uh, with pictures of John Bonet in his bag, a poem that he'd written to John Bonet uh, called Ode to John Bonet. And he was also found with a stun gun. And that was kind of a crucial development for investigators because 
um, over the course of their investigation, after the first few months, they kind of theorized that perhaps that she was subdued with the stun gun um, prior to her death. So that's when police started looking at, looking at Gary, which was four years later. Yet nothing seemed to come of it all. Um, was he, and my understanding, there's a photo of him or images of him at a vigil for John Bonet as well? Yeah, that's right. So this vigil uh, took place on the year anniversary of her death. So that was on Christmas night, I believe that was held, uh, a short distance away from the Ramsey's home. And that picture uh, that, that, that we published was actually taken by private investigators hired by John Ramsey, um, who were investigating Gary at that time, believing him to be a very credible suspect and certainly somebody that's, that's capable of, of committing um, such a horrific act. The Boulder police wouldn't look at Gary uh, for another three years after that. Unbelievable. Um, one final question. How specific um, were the details in these letters, these alleged confession letters? Yeah, so the confession letters were, were uh, written in and around 2019. There's, there's roughly a dozen of them. Um, one of them, I can, I can read you here, I've got it written, uh, written down below me here. It says, uh, I, I never loved anyone like I did John Bonet, yet I let her slip and her head bashed in half, and I watched her die. It was an accident, please believe me. Um, so, he, you know, he's claiming that he killed John Bonet by accident. Whether or not you, you, can, you can take that at face value, who knows, that's for Boulder Police to investigate. They did acknowledge um, the confession letters when they were first published in 2019, um, but seemed to kind of brush them under the carpet. They said, you know, we've, we've heard uh, this guy confess before, and we've looked into it. There's no further updates in this case. But I think, you know, certainly he, uh, he, he's a character that, that John Ramsey was particularly interested in. I think he's certainly somebody that's, that's worth having a second look at. Absolutely. Luke Kenton, U.S. son. Uh, great job. Thanks so much, Luke. Appreciate it. All right, folks, let's bring back in our think tank. So, to me... Right, we had John Mark Carr, who did the initial confession. They brought the guy back from Bangkok. I went out there, everyone out there. Unbelievable, at the time, the biggest moment in court TV history, when John Mark Carr first appeared in court in the United States. He didn't do it, right? It was just, you know, a little woof. So, to me, the key to this whole thing seems to be, if you don't mind, I'll go to Erica first, you guys <laughs> mind? Um, seems to be this, this phone call. And I don't know if you can go back to 1996 to track phone records, probably can't. But to me, that is the, the key. That's what makes this a little different. Yeah, I mean, listen, I'm so glad that as time progresses, we're getting more information. I mean, finally, we got something that's giving us some indication of who possibly might have done it because it's been any and everybody that's been blamed for this. This is my new anecdote when I get asked about beyond a reasonable doubt and sufficiency of investigations. This is the most investigated case of my life. And here we had a report immediately, then three months later, never heard back, four years later, maybe we'll look at it. Now, 19 years later? And people ask about how we trust our criminal prosecution system and how we get to reason this. I believe in our criminal prosecution system, but 19 years later, it's too much information that we can never prove. Just can't be done. Way never beyond into the exclusion of every reasonable. Yeah, I think that's 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 the problem, right? Proving it, but trying to figure out who could have been responsible. All right, folks, programming note. John Bonet's father, John Ramsey, will join us live Friday night to discuss the latest in this investigation. We'll talk about this man. Um, Friday night, 8 o'clock Eastern, right here on Closing Arguments.